greatness is not this um, wonderful, esoteric, elusive, uh, godlike feature that only the special among us are, will ever taste. You know, it's something that truly exists in all of us. It's very simple. This is what I believe, and I'm willing to die for it. You know, a lot of us are going through a hard time in life. Some people have been bullied, some people are just stressed out, some people are insecure, some people are fat and overweight, and the world puts a lot of this shit in your mind. It's not just you, yeah, you help it. And my whole thing is about, I had to develop a mindset, a mindset that was indestructible. I had to armor plate my mind. And it's about what you're saying to yourself, but it also comes with work. So whenever I was getting beat down, physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever I was going through, just saying, you know, I would put, you know, you can't hurt me. I want your dream to be so clear that when you wake up in the morning, all you gotta do is step in your dream. And the first step for me was seeing something I was not before I was. You can do it. Where you are is temporary. You will not be there for the rest of your life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to be easy. It was hard laying on the floor of the Penobscot building, looking out of the window, daydreaming, saying, Les, can you do this? Can you make this happen? I used to listen to tapes day in and day out about See You at the Top, my, my great friend Zig and, and, and Dennis Waitley and different other motivational speakers and Dr. Norman Vincent Peale and Dexter saying, don't let nobody steal your dream. I used to ask myself, can I do this? And something said within me, you're the one. You're the one. The only way the commitment and the energy and the momentum continues is if you take immediate, massive action. You need to take massive action. And if that doesn't work, try something else. If that doesn't work, try something else. Keep going with massive action and you will find the way because it will give you momentum. I'm going to customize it around, around you be able to learn. How many people have a subject or skill you'd like to learn faster? Can you think of one right now in your mind? Like, I want you to just think about a subject that you're having a challenge in or something you really want to master. It could be marketing, it could be Mandarin, it could be music, it could be martial arts. Think about a subject or skill, because I want to make this extremely, extremely practical. So here's what I want you to remember. Now, when I, um, See, the reason why I know you can learn how to do this is because a lot of people don't know, I, um, I grew up with learning challenges, okay? And I don't share this a lot, but at the age of five, I had a very bad accident, uh, head trauma, brain injury, and I had learning difficulties. I was put in very special classes. Uh, teachers would have to repeat themselves five, six, seven times to me, and I still wouldn't understand. I would pretend I understood, but I didn't really understand. I had very poor focus. I had a very bad memory. Um, it took me an extra four years to learn how to read. And it was really hard. You think about school where you're passing around. Remember you used to pass around that book and you had to read out loud? And when that book got closer and closer and closer, I would get so nervous. I think actually a lot of people who have a fear of public speaking, that's where it actually came from, right? Because that was a learned association that we have, right? I read, I read recently that uh, the fear of public speaking is actually the number one fear in, in this country. Number two is fire. Number three is death. It's crazy, right? So really, when you're thinking about it, some, you know, if somebody's at a funeral or something, somebody would rather be like in the casket than actually giving the eulogy, right? Because people are so scared of public speaking. But I think the reason why people are so scared is they're scared they're gonna forget what they need to say, right? And so I teach a lot of the Tedsters how to be able to memorize their speeches. A lot of actors, uh, you know, from Jim Carrey to Will Smith, be able to teach them how to memorize their lines here in Hollywood because it's such a valuable skill, right? Because I believe two of the most costly words in business are I forgot. You know, I forgot to do it. I forgot that conversation I had with that person. I forgot that client information. I forgot what I needed to say. I forgot that meeting. I forgot where I put it. I forgot that person's name. Every time you hear yourself say those words, you know, you lose time, you lose opportunity, you lose credibility, right? 
And so I know like after compensating, I learned all these ways to compensate and now I teach these individuals, but I know you have genius inside of you, right? So I'm gonna show you how to activate that other 90% of the potential. So what I want you to remember though, is if you wanna learn, here's what I, what I believe, that genius leaves clues. Genius leaves clues. That when somebody does something extraordinary, that you could see them do something extraordinary in any field, whether it's art, architecture, it could be mathematics, it could be fashion, whatever it is, and you could leave, or you could say, wow, that person's amazing, how do they do that? Because there's always a method behind the magic. When you see magic in the world, there's always a method, but it's usually unconscious. I was reading and spending time with a book called Change or Die. The book proved that most people would rather die than change. So this is not for the masses. I'm not trying to reach the masses. Even the book of life says that the road to life, not to road to survival, what it takes to live and what it takes to survive are two different things. The road to life is straight and narrow and few there be that find it. Why? Because the majority of people not looking for life. They just want to survive and be entertained and have a good time. Let me, let me share something with you. I want you to write this down. Step out of line. You don't want to be like everybody else. Step out of line. And so the only way we get to that ultimate version of ourselves is by replacing ourselves and growing all the time. This has to become an addiction for you. It has to become an emergency. And every time you don't make it an emergency, it's not a crisis. You're not in a hurry. It's almost like if I don't do this, I will die. I found something I could do, which was easy, but I worked hard at it. I got up early and stayed up late, worked hard that six years. But what I did was easy, meaning it was something I could do. Write down at least five reasons on why you deserve your dream, on why you won't give up, what's going to make you unstoppable, why you must be unreasonable, because logical, practical thinking says you can't do it today. But if you want to produce unreasonable results in your life, like living your dream and taking charge of your destiny, you've got to be an unreasonable person. You've got to be an uncommon person. So write down the reasons of why you're here. If you know why you're doing something, when the hard times come and they're gonna come, when the disappointments and the rejections come and they're gonna come by the truckloads, your reasons will be your rod and staff to comfort you, to pick you up. Once again, I got a saying on one of my tapes, if life knocks you down, try and land on your back. Because if you can look up, you can get up. Let your reasons get you back up. If you have friends, that make you wrong for changing your life for the better, that's their issue. It's not yours. And so you gotta untangle the fact that they have baggage about getting in shape or they have baggage about going to the bar that's theirs. And it has nothing to do with the decisions that you're making. So if your friends in general give you blowback for changing for the better, what you need to say in the back of your mind is interesting. They're obviously very conflicted about their choice to go to the bar and drink every night, but that has nothing to do with me. Here's the other thing you can do. If they start to make you wrong, you can say, well, you wanna go to Planet Fitness with me instead? It doesn't sound like you wanna be at the bar. So that said, let me talk to you a little bit about friends. Friends are people that you care about. And I have this test, I call it the funeral test. If somebody in your life were to die, ask yourself, would I go to their funeral? If the answer is yes, they're a friend of yours. That's the test for whether or not, in my opinion, someone is a friend, because it means you care about them. Now, here's the other thing about friendship that I want you to understand. You can care about somebody and not like hanging out with them. And that's the situation that you're in right now, that you have plenty of friends that you care about. If they were to die, you would go to their funeral. If they needed you, you would be there. If you saw them, you'd be happy to see them, but you don't like to hang out with them. The other thing that I want you to think about is that, and that's okay, that's like a normal 
part of friendship. And the reason why that's a normal part of friendship is because one of the things that we know about life is that you're always going to be changing. In the old pattern, in the old chapter, you had certain patterns, right? In the old chapter of your life, you would go to the bar and drink. You would go to the store and spend money you didn't have. You're in a new chapter now. And so you have different patterns. When your life takes on different patterns, whether it's you're no longer going to the bar, you're going to the gym, the pattern might even be that one of your kids is playing with a different soccer team, or maybe you've moved to a different street in your town. When the patterns change, so will your circle of friends. It's a fact of life. But that doesn't mean your old friends, the ones that you used to drink with, aren't friends anymore. It just means that you don't want to hang out with them. You still care about them, but you don't like doing what they do. The patterns have changed. For a long time, I had a lot of drama around this until I realized that it's not personal. It's not personal that you don't want to hang out with them. Patterns in your life have simply changed. The final thing that I want to leave you with that may also help you is that remember I've given you the funeral test. If you'd go to their funeral, they're definitely a friend. It means you care about them, but you might not like hanging out with them that much, and that's cool. That's normal. The other thing that I want you to think about when it comes to friendships is you can typically put friends into three buckets. You got friends for a reason, you got friends for a season, and you have friends for a lifetime. And one of the interesting things that I know about my own life is that as the patterns of my life change, so do the friends that I hang out with more frequently. And I also believe that as you change and the patterns in your life change, people show up in your life for a reason. The right people will show up when you start going to the gym. The right people that you need for the pattern that you're in right now will start showing up when you're working on your project instead of shopping. And it's exactly the kind of people that you need. They're there for a reason. And the friends of yours that are friends of yours for a lifetime, I bet you don't hang out with them that much at all anyway. But I bet they're the first person that you call when you need to talk to somebody about somebody important. Those are the friends for a lifetime. And those folks that are still sitting at the bar and love to blow money that they don't have, those were friends for a season. Thank you.